Attention, United Federation cadets. Attention, United Federation cadets. Fix your cadet logs at stardate 307, Mark 4. You are about to commence level two of basic interstellar orientation. The constellations as seen from the northern hemisphere on Earth. This portion of your training will focus on two most important aspects of starship operation, navigation and interstellar charting. Knowledge of the constellations will provide the essential experience you will need to command your own starship in much the same manner as one of the greatest starship captains in Federation history, James T. Kirk. Completion of this orientation will qualify you as a Federation Lieutenant First Class, eligible for commission on board a Federation starship. Part of this training is a simulated voyage through the galaxies, so ready your Constellation identification cards and Star Trek pointer. You may at any time stop this tape to review a section, or simply to get your equipment in order. Your intergalactic planetarium will aid in taking our journey through the stars, stars like our own sun, only much farther away from Earth. This training will help you become a Starfleet commander, so pay close attention, and good luck. Why did man first begin investigating the sky above? Thousands of years ago, before venturing into space was even considered, our ancestors studied the stars, seeking answers to why they were on Earth. By trying to understand why the sun rose, the moon changed phases, and the stars drifted, they hoped to gain more control and insight into earthly life. But the stars never really gave man a complete explanation of his existence. Soon, however, he began to see a relationship between changes in the sky and changes on the earth. Man began to know when to plant his crops, when the rivers would overflow or run dry. As the stars moved across the sky, they told him the time of night and when daylight would arrive. They indicated when the weather would turn warmer or colder. When man wandered from region to region, they showed him which way to go and how to get back home. And when man sailed the seas, the stars provided a familiar guide for navigation. As he became better acquainted with his surroundings, man began to name the lights above. He connected the lights in much the same way we now connect numbered dots in a puzzle to form familiar figures. With some imagination, outlines could be seen in the sky. Stories were created about these figures so their shapes could be more easily recognized. These shapes or groups of stars were called constellations, from the Latin word con, meaning together, and stellar, meaning star. One outline which contains over 200 stars took the form of a great bear. Ursa Major is the Latin name for the great bear. Its principal stars, called the Big Dipper, is one of the most easily recognizable star groups. Next to the great bear was a form imagined to be a smaller bear, Ursa Minor in Latin. This group of stars is called the Little Dipper. Since these constellations are especially important, take a few minutes and be sure you can recognize them. You can stop the recorder if you need more time. The stars of the Big and Little Dippers seem close together. Actually, like other constellation stars, they are millions of miles away from each other and even farther away from Earth. In fact, the nearest star next to our own sun, Alpha Centauri, is approximately 24 trillion miles away. If we make a scale with the Earth being one inch away from our sun, on this same scale, Alpha Centauri would be four miles away from us. A journey to these far reaches of the universe would take many hundreds of years, even if we could really travel at the fastest of speeds, the speed of light. At this speed, a year's journey would take us six million million miles. Scientists call this distance one light year. Journeys of 10 or even a thousand times greater don't even begin to reach the limits of space. The best method of finding your way in space is to start with a familiar point, and as you explore and learn more about it, expand from there. You can recognize stars by their brightness and location in the constellations. On a clear night, it is easier to distinguish the color of some stars and thereby determine their heat. Blue stars are the hottest, hotter than 60,000 degrees centigrade. White stars are approximately 20,000 degrees, and red stars a cool 5,500 degrees. Our own sun has a surface temperature around 6,000 degrees. On our journey, we'll be traveling through constellations with stars many times hotter than our sun. 
So chart your journey carefully with the Star Trek pointer as practice for future in-flight training. Using the pointer, start with one of the easiest groups of stars to find, the Big Dipper. It is composed of seven bright stars that form the outline of a dipper. Can you find it? Take your time. See how it is a part of Ursa Major? A legend told about Ursa Major concerns the great spirit who put the great bear in the sky to serve as a calendar for all bears on Earth. The bears stay in their dens to keep warm when the great bear is low in the sky. When he is high in the sky, it's all right for earthly bears to leave their dens, for it is warm outside. Not everyone, understandably, was able to see a bear in the constellation. Don't be surprised if you don't see a bear either. What do you see? The ancient Sumerians saw a long chariot. To the Chinese, Ursa Major was known as the Northern Bushel, and to the Persians as the Seven Enthroned Ones. In England, this constellation is still called the Plow. Regardless of what image the mind makes out, modern astronomers agree to call this constellation Ursa Major. At whatever hour of the night or season of the year, if you turn north, you can spot the Big Dipper. When you look at the Big Dipper, the stars all seem to move in the same direction. But in fact, each star is moving in a slightly different direction. This is true of all stars, as the universe is constantly moving, expanding, and drifting. This constant motion will eventually turn the dipper into a different shape. Years from now, no one will be able to see a dipper. The constellation will have a much flatter cup and a much more hooked handle, like a sideways figure two. All the constellations we're going to discuss will be changing, and as future space travelers, it is important to study these changes. But now, imagine a line going between the two stars that form the front part of the Big Dipper's bowl. This line would lead directly to the last star in the handle of the Little Dipper in the constellation of Fursa Minor. Can you find it? This star is quite famous, called Polaris, or more commonly, the North Star. It is the closest to the Earth's North Pole if a pole were extended directly up from the Earth through space. All the stars in their constellations appear to be rotating around the North Star every 24 hours. Because the North Star appears motionless, and all the other stars appear to be circling it, this star has become a reference point for travelers. Looking at the stationary North Star in the center of the sky, it can easily be determined that south is behind you, east to the right, west to the left. Remember that the North Pole doesn't really exist. It is an imaginary term developed by astronomers to help us understand the Earth's movement. These concepts can be difficult to comprehend. For more than 2,000 years, the best scientists in the world thought the Earth stood still, while all the magnificent stars in the sky whirled around it. Now we realize that although the stars do have a movement of their own, the rotation we see in the sky is due to the Earth's revolving, and not, as the many legends suggest, by the stars spinning around us. You will notice this on your first voyage. Even the American Indians made up legends about the stars. According to one, an Indian hunting party became lost in the woods. As if in answer to their prayers, a little girl appeared to guide them home. She turned out to be the spirit of the North Star. Even in this day of modern space exploration and scientific discovery, the North Star is still used as a navigational aid to help ships and explorers maintain their proper courses. As we mentioned earlier, the North Star is part of the constellation Ursa Minor and is the tip star of the Little Dipper. Like its bigger brother, the Little Dipper also contains seven stars and is shaped similarly. Traveling near the Little Dipper, so far away from Earth, increases the possibility of encountering other life forms. What would be your response if you encountered an alien spaceship apparently in distress? How would you know it isn't a trap? Moving to the other side of the Pole Star and opposite Ursa Major, is another easily recognized constellation, Cassiopeia. Though not included on the constellation cards, try to make it out. One of the prettiest of all constellations, Cassiopeia forms either a capital M or W, depending upon its position in the sky. Consisting of seven stars, two not very bright, it forms a rather uncomfortable looking chair. According to Greek mythology, Cassiopeia was the beautiful queen of Ethiopia. Her husband, Cepheus, and daughter, Andromeda, each have a constellation named after them. Cepheus is a very important constellation. Eventually, one of its three brightest stars will become the new North Star. 
the constant motion of the stars will take Polaris from its present position and replace it with one of the stars that now make up the crown on Cetus's cap. Andromeda is also very important because within the outline of its stars, a small hazy patch of light can be seen. This is the famous Andromeda Nebula and is the most distant object that can be seen without a telescope. A nebula is made up of huge clouds of interstellar dust and gas. But early in the 1900s, it was discovered that the Andromeda Nebula contained billions and billions of stars and was actually another galaxy. This great nebula looks small because of its distance from Earth. For even if we traveled at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, it would take us about three million years to reach Andromeda. But for now, let's turn our attention closer to Earth, to the imaginary belt of constellations called the Zodiac. Early astronomers used these constellations, 12 in all, to predict the future, a practice which has passed on to a less scientific group called astrologers. Arrange your constellation identification cards so you can compare and locate these constellations. The word Zodiac comes from the Greek word meaning animals. And as you might expect, most of the 12 constellations are named after some animal. The Zodiac is an important subject for study because of its usefulness in interplanetary navigation. From every point in our solar system, the Zodiac appears the same. We can plot a course safely through the asteroid belt and around all our neighboring planets using the Zodiac as a guide. Beyond Pluto, the farthest planet in our solar system, the Zodiac won't be much help as we will be looking at it from a completely different angle. We'll almost certainly need a new set of star charts before traveling that far. The Zodiac dates back at least 5,000 years when the ancient Sumerians first named these constellations. They started with Aries, meaning ram in Latin. It is one of the smaller constellations composed of three main stars forming a rather flat-looking triangle. From Aries, we travel to Taurus, Latin for the bull. It shouldn't be too difficult to make out the form of a bull in this constellation. The stars are relatively bright. In fact, one of its stars, Aldebaran, near the bull's neck, is over a hundred times brighter and almost 40 times bigger than our own sun. Consider for a moment how big our sun is. If we were to open the sun and try to fill it with Earth, it would take a million globes to completely equal its size. Our travels through space will bring us to thousands of stars even bigger than Aldebaran. Next, we travel into Gemini, the twins in Latin. As far back as the ancient Babylonians, the image of two twins standing side by side was recognized in this star group. Gemini made a name for itself in astronomical history when scientists studying the constellation discovered the planets Uranus and Pluto. On March 13, 1781, a British musician and amateur astronomer, Sir William Herschel, chanced upon what he realized could not have been another Gemini star. It must have been a planet. Astronomers called the newly discovered planet Uranus, after the god of the heavens. 149 years later to the day, astronomers working at the Lowell Observatory in Arizona discovered the planet Pluto, also in Gemini. On a clear night, try to identify this constellation and see if you can find any planets. Pluto, however, is much too small to be seen without a telescope. Very close to the feet of the Gemini twins is another constellation not in the zodiac, but very important, Orion the Hunter. You might be able to make out a club in his raised hand near Gemini. In the other hand, he holds a shield, and his belt is outlined by three bright stars all in a row. No other constellation has as many bright stars as this groupie. In Orion's left shoulder, Betelgeuse, 400 times bigger than the sun and over 3,000 times brighter, is considered a super giant star. For such a star as Betelgeuse to form, vast amounts of dust particles and gas in space must combine. Eventually, the gas ignites in a continuous nuclear explosion. Man has actually witnessed the beginnings of a star deep in a part of Orion. Gemini is followed by the constellation Cancer, Latin for the crab. It is the faintest and most inconspicuous star group in the zodiac. Nevertheless, on a clear night, it still can be seen without a telescope. Leo is the easily recognized constellation with the Latin name for lion. In Greek mythology, Leo represents the lion slain by the great god Hercules. 
Regulus, the brightest star in this constellation, is more than 150 times brighter than our own sun. Let's continue our trip by again returning to the Big Dipper and following the curve of its handle to the main stars in the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin. Virgo represents the goddess of love, or the mother goddess, in mythology. It is the second largest constellation in the sky, and an interesting one to travel through. Within its borders are thousands of galaxies. Astronomers estimate that there might be over 4,000 galaxies and countless stars within Virgo. Perhaps sometime in the future, you'll partake in the actual colonization of new galaxies. Imagine the preparations needed to provide for large groups of people traveling to distant planets. Consider the different problems you'd be faced with as leader of a future space colony as we journey to Libra, a zodiac constellation distinguished by two stars of similar brightness. If the stars were closer together, it would look exactly like Gemini. Most stars in this constellation, though, are relatively faint. The original shape given Libra is a matter of some debate. Libra means balance or scales in Latin. But it wasn't given that name until Roman times. Evidence shows that it was originally thought to be the claws of a neighboring constellation, Scorpius, the Scorpion. And the twin stars still keep their funny Arabic names, Zuben el Ganubi and Zuben Eskamali, meaning northern and southern claw. The constellation that looks most like its given name is Scorpius. A number of relatively bright stars outline its head, body, and tail. One star, Antares, a reddish star, is over 3,000 times brighter and 300 times bigger than our sun. It, too, is a super giant star. After Scorpius, our starship journey takes us to Sagittarius, the archer. Much study of this constellation was completed by Edward Emerson Bernard in 1884 who estimated many stars in this constellation to be nearly two million light years away from Earth. Greek mythology differs as to who this archer really is. Some say he is Crotus, who lived on Mount Helicon, where he became the swiftest of hunters, and was later placed in the sky by Zeus. On a clear night, if you look at Sagittarius, you might notice a belt of white dust near the four stars that outline his body. This belt is the Milky Way galaxy, to which we on Earth belong. Like other galaxies, the Milky Way is composed of millions upon millions of stars, including our own sun. Scientists estimate that our galaxy is so large, it would take 100,000 years traveling at the speed of light to cross it. Capricornus, our next stop, is rather inconspicuous. Located to the east of Sagittarius, this constellation was known to the ancients as the Goatfish. More recently, it has been called the Horned Goat. This is one of the most difficult of the constellations to make out. So when you're in command of your starship, you might want to use special light amplifiers to help see it. Let's continue now to Aquarius. To early stargazers, Aquarius was the image of a young man pouring water from an urn into the mouth of Pisces Austrinus, the southern fish constellation, just beneath Aquarius. To the ancient Sumerians, this was one of the most important constellations. Aquarius represented their sky god, An, pouring life-giving water to Earth. They called it the Great Constellation. The last sign of the zodiac, Pisces, was thought to consist of two fish tied together by a knotted string or chain. This constellation fits into the zodiac between Aquarius and Aries. Try to learn the proper order of the zodiac signs. This will make space navigation simpler, since once you identify one of the signs, the rest will be easy to find. As you've seen, there's much to explore in this vast universe of ours. And as space cadets, you'll have the chance to expand the frontiers of scientific knowledge and to answer many questions that still remain a mystery. Is there an end to the vast sea of stars? What lies beyond the constellations we have visited? Are new planets and stars still being created? Right now, we're on the forefront of new discoveries. There's much to be learned about this fantastic universe of ours. Just turn on your intergalactic planetarium and embark on a passage through the boundless realms of space. Space represents the final frontier. And soon we'll be joining the team that unravels the intriguing mysteries of the limitless universe.